Gentleman yields back. The, uh, the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to uh, yield to uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, as much time as she may consume. Gentleman, a gentlewoman from Texas is recognized for such time. I, as she I may thank consume. the ranking member. I thank the chairman as well. We we have worked. Uh, Mr. Smith and I have worked together on the immigration issue, uh, and uh, I would beg uh, uh, to differ. Um, uh, it is well documented uh, that regularized individuals in certain industries would in fact create jobs and create investment into this country, but as well uh, that um, as you have one person working, um, that person generates the opportunity for, for another. Uh, in construction jobs, for example, um, there are opportunities uh, when you are involved in construction and have the right trained persons, it creates uh, expanded, expanded jobs. Uh, but I also want to make mention that uh, as we may have cited uh, the 600 jobs loss uh, because allegedly of a CBO report, uh, I know that 500 jobs have been lost uh, because of a merger uh, between two major giants in the aviation industry. Uh, and frankly, I would hope that we could focus on uh, whether that is um, a, um, a, um, one of the diminishing aspects of mergers that individuals do lose jobs. But I will also say to you uh, that uh, we have documentation here that 1.1 million private sector jobs have been created since the enactment of health care reform. I mentioned 300, it's in growing. I mentioned, I'm sorry, 3 million jobs in my statement. One point have already been created, 1.1 million private sector jobs. 207,000 jobs in the health care industry have been created since the enactment of health reform. Under the past administration, President Bush, 673,000 jobs, private sector jobs are lost. And this was a Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, the claim that the health care reform law will cost 800,000 jobs or has is misconstrued because last year's debate showed that the health care bill will save taxpayers billions of dollars and give consumers more better access to health care. In fact, the private sector job growth has been strong since the enactment of health care. Again, 1.1 uh, million jobs have been uh, created. So we can, we'll have a constant debate about numbers, but I, I think there is a vigorous debate of how uh, these uh, jobs could be lost. The real issue is this is a Judiciary Committee, the protective rights of the American people. And I have cited, and the ranking member cited, and uh, uh, Mr. Cohen has cited, uh, ways that we can be constructive to create jobs in America, uh, to protect the consumer, uh, and to ensure that competition is fair and healthy and I would, Madam Speaker, simply ask my colleagues to engage in that kind of work as opposed to work that will take up the time of this body uh, and delay us from doing the people's work and providing justice for all. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Um, Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, a member of the Judiciary Committee. Gentleman from Florida. From Florida, sorry, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Today, I rise in strong support of House Resolution 72. Now more than ever, regulatory, regulatory reform is needed of agencies who have expanded their authority to levels far beyond than what was ever intended in circumvention of the legislative process. At a time of record unemployment, the last thing business, and in particular our small businesses, need is burdensome regulations and added compliance costs. Why would we make it harder for our job creators to expand and to grow? Shouldn't we create an environment that fosters prosperity, innovation, and global marketplace for competitiveness? For example, in my home state of Florida, we have what's known as numeric nutrient water criteria that's being thrust upon us by the EPA, a, a, a regulatory law that's, that's, that's supported by nothing but junk science, not accepted principles of science, and yet what it's going to do is cost my citrus industry $325 million in initial compliance costs. It's going to cost my agricultural industry anywhere from $855 million to $3 billion in initial costs with an annual impact of $1.1 billion to Florida's overall economy and over 14,000 jobs lost. Those jobs lost in an economy like this. In Florida, water is our livelihood. We can regulate our own control of water. We believe in clean water, but we need to have a voice in what is happening to us by these regulatory controls. It is unfair that we have elected agencies um, like the EPA have unchecked rulemaking authority 
and prevent, prevent Florida's job creators from employing hardworking citizens in need of jobs. We are regulating jobs out of existence. Would those who promote more regulatory control not be satisfied until we have choked the last breath out of our American economy and our American job market because of too much regulatory control? Massive oversight is needed, and I applaud congressional efforts to reform the current out-of-control regulatory process. The RAINS Act, the Regulatory uh, Flexibility Improvements Act, and the Administrative Procedures Act reform are necessary. They will provide transparency to a rulemaking process and give business, large and small, proper due process in agency decisions that greatly affect them. They are the important first steps that will allow businesses the ability to grow, our citizens to work, and our economy to flourish. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back my time. The gentleman from Florida yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. The gentleman you, has 15 thank seconds. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. I wanted to uh, suggest that uh, the gentleman from Texas, Judge Poe, a distinguished member of the Judiciary Committee, who raised the uh, criticism about the new uh, 1099 rule uh, that is a job killer. And I wanted him to know... The uh, gentleman's time has expired. Could... The, could the uh, chairman, Madam Speaker, um, the gentleman from Texas, I understand that the ranking member is short of time, and I would like unanimous consent to give him uh, four minutes of the time that I have left. Objection. The uh, the gentleman has uh, will control the time. Thank you, Chairman Smith. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Judge Poe uh, referenced the new 1099 rules, and apparently. He and the president are, are in, a, in agreement because uh, the rule expands re reporting requirements to include transactions of $600 or more. President Obama has stated that he is open to reconsidering these rules in the light of uh, the burden that it brings on small business. So I'd, I'd like to suggest that there is at least one point of accord, there may be others, uh, between the members of the rules uh, of the Judiciary Committee in the consideration uh, of the matter before us. Now I, I return to the, uh, the assertion that the health care bill uh, proudly referred to by some on this side of the aisle as the Obamacare, uh, that this bill will cost 800,000 jobs. And uh, I'd like to suggest that this misleading figure has been floating around since last summer. Uh, this is why uh, in the Hill article on the CBO, today said, G -O, quote, GOP jumps on old job numbers, end quote. Uh, what CBO said last summer was that if health insurance is affordable, a person who was working a bad job just to keep health care might be able to leave the job. Now, surely we wouldn't want a person uh, who is uh, suffering from a pre-existing uh, disability uh, that would be able under this expanded health care to keep on working when all the, reason, the only reason he was working in the first place was to get the health care that, that uh, was otherwise until now unavailable. If people can get health insurance despite pre-existing conditions, then such folks might be able to leave their work. And I'm, sh I'm sure that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, wouldn't have any objection to that. And, and yes, it might reduce the number of people uh, uh, working, but it would save lives. That's what, that's what health care is about. A person uh, who is not eligible for Medicare 
because he or she was under 65, might choose to retire and get private insurance instead of staying on the job until Medicare uh, becomes available. Others who needed to work a second job just to afford, afford health care may not now need to do it because we made health care more affordable. Uh, for goodness sake, uh, I, I can't imagine that anybody under the example that I've used uh, would, would uh, be uh, uh, opposed uh, to a person leaving a job under that circumstance. That does not mean that that is costing jobs in America. It's saving lives. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Texas. Madam Speaker, I'll yield myself uh, 30 seconds. The gentleman is recognized uh, for 30 seconds. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to point out that the figure we've been using that the health care bill is going to cost 800,000 jobs is not necessarily an old figure, or maybe I should concede it's a day old because that figure came from yesterday's testimony by the budget director uh, in front of the budget committee. Uh, I said budget director, it's the, um, let me read the statement. Uh, testifying today before the House Budget Committee Congressional Budget Office Director Doug Elmendorf confirmed that Obamacare is expected to reduce the number of jobs in the labor market by an estimated 800,000 people. And here are the, I'll yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentlemen, uh, Here are the excerpts from the exchange. And in response to a couple of questions by members of Congress, the last question was from uh, Representative John Campbell of California. Uh, the director of the CBO said in response to a question, is it going to cost 800,000 jobs? His one word answer was yes. Uh, so those are fresh figures, they are accurate figures, and I think we need to be very acutely aware of just how many jobs the new health care plan is going to cost. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd now like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Griffin, uh, who is also a member of the Judiciary Committee. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in support and strong support of HRS 72 because I believe that a number of regulations issued by the federal agencies are stifling job creation. And from the sound of it, President Obama agrees. On January 18 of this year, President Obama issued an executive order stating that, quote, our regulatory system must promote economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation. I agree with the President on all those points. Some regulations are critical to protect our health and provide a safe place to live and work. But there are a number of regulations affecting job creators, including small businesses and community banks. These regulations are overly burdensome, repetitive, and just plain don't make sense. Not a day goes by without one of my constituents complaining over the EPA's overreaching policies. The administration is trying to do through regulations what it couldn't get passed into law. As a result, job creators spend their money complying with these burdensome regulations, money that should be used to create jobs, money that should be used to invest in research and capital improvements, and money that sh should be used to spur innovation. For example, job creators are spending money planning for more burdensome EPA regulations on boilers, boilers used every day to heat schools and businesses. And now the EPA wants to apply the oil spill law to force dairy farmers to spend millions of dollars preparing for spilled milk because of the amount of fat in it. What if it's skim milk? If it wasn't so troubling, it might be funny. On top of this, regulations yet to be written inject uncertainty into the economy, further stifling job creation. Uncertainty over renewable tax credits, for example, is forcing a Little Rock company back home in my district to stop building wind turbines because they don't know if they can sell them. I've heard concerns back home over the lack of transparency from unelected federal workers that, that have never met the folks in Arkansas, and they've never held a town hall. They don't hold town halls before they write these regulations, yet they pass the equivalent of laws every day. We can do better. 
Let's seek common sense solutions to our problems and stop the federal government from killing jobs. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll yield myself the balance of my time. The gentleman is recognized. The American people and American employers know what Washington has not learned. Too many regulations impose too many costs and cost too many jobs. The Judiciary Committee is working hard on the reforms we need to tame Washington and unleash American businesses to create jobs. We should pass the RAINS Act, pass the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, reform the Administrative Procedure Act and the practice of too many regulations with too many costs for too few benefits. Um, Madam Speaker, I think this debate really comes down to a very simple question. Uh, there are those who favor a government of regulations and there are those of us who feel that Congress should oversee and approve the most burdensome regulations. Uh, any member of Congress who feels that Congress should oversee and approve the most burdensome regulations, I believe, will support this bill. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of time. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Klein. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise today in support of the resolution, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for such time as he may consume. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today's effort is driven by a simple goal, to ensure every area of the federal government is dedicated to job creation. If we are to get the nation back to work, we all must work together to remove barriers to economic growth and prosperity. Every job matters, and every effort, effort to help create a new job matters. The American people have demonstrated a relentless determination to make the difficult choices necessary to get through these tough times. We should do no less. Employers need certainty, flexibility, and freedom to expand their businesses and hire new workers. Red tape should not tie down economic growth, and onerous regulations should not be roadblocks to job creation. Congress can no longer accept sweeping changes that affect the lives of students and workers without first determining whether it is good for our long-term competitiveness, good for job creators, and good for our economy. We were sent here to focus on getting the economy back on track and the American people back to work. Today, we are moving forward with our commitment to do just that. In my conversations with constituents, I've seen the desperation that follows months of searching in vain for work. I've also witnessed the hope that is renewed at the prospect of future employment. Everyone agrees you need rules of the road and common sense protections. Bad actors will always exist and they must be held accountable for breaking the law. But we shouldn't accept lost wages, lost jobs, and lost opportunities as inevitable consequences to advancing fairness, accountability, and responsibility. The Education and Workforce Committee oversees a broad range of policies that affect the nation's workplaces and classrooms. A number of those policies will be discussed by other leaders of the committee in a few moments. In the time remaining for myself, I would like to discuss one area in particular that deserves closer examination. Is the federal government using its authority fairly and on behalf of American workers, or is it pursuing a partisan agenda that makes our workplaces less competitive? 
The National Labor Relations Board is an independent federal agency created by Congress more than 75 years ago. The NLRB is charged with preventing and remedying unfair labor practices and establishing whether employees desire union representation. Its responsibility is to fairly protect the rights of workers against unlawful encroachments by employers and unions. Unfortunately, the board has recently shown an eagerness to tilt the playing field in favor of powerful special interest. A culture of union favoritism has seized the board with consequences that reach into virtually every workplace. Stripping workers of the right to a secret ballot through a backdoor card check scheme is just one looming threat. The board also has threatened legal action against states seeking to protect the secret ballot, and it has diminished safeguards for employers. We cannot allow the board to rewrite the rules of the game to circumvent the will of Congress in pursuit of its own job-destroying agenda. The same culture of union favoritism has also swept across this administration, expanding protections for big labor at the expense of rank-and-file workers. Project labor agreements and high-road contracting sound innocent enough, but they put small businesses and the vast majority of their workers at a disadvantage, at the expense of the taxpayers, I might add. These are the kinds of policies that should be examined to determine whether they undermine economic growth. Our efforts will not be blinded by partisanship. If we learned, learn of a rule or regulation that stands in the way of a strong workforce, regardless of the Congress or administration that put it in place, we will take a look at it. This is a critically important responsibility, and I look forward to working with every member of Congress to get it done. Madam Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support this resolution and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The uh, gentlelady from California is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to uh, yield as much time as he may con consume to the gentleman from New Jersey, Rob Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for such time as he may consume. I unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my friend from California for yielding. Uh, as we meet this morning, there are 15 million unemployed people in our country. And what I'm hearing from our constituents is they want us to work together to find ways to help the job generators of this country, small businesses and entrepreneurs, to put Americans back to work. Here we are again, really just having a political discussion that doesn't hire a person, help a company, or really go anywhere. Um, frankly, the majority has gone from ignoring the unemployment problem to worsening it in the last couple of days. In the five weeks that they've been in the majority, there's not been one bill, not one word, not one hour of debate on a bill that would create jobs in the American economy. Instead, what we've had is a series of political exercises that have ignored their promise to, quote, focus like a laser beam on job creation, close quote. Now, the problem has gotten worse this week and it practically will get worse as the day goes on with the announcement of the majority's plan to finish out the budget year with massive cuts in the budget. Now, let me say from the outset, we agree completely that sensible spending restraint is necessary to reverse our trend of deficit and debt and help the American people and the American economy. And we look forward to working with our friends in the Republican Party to make that a reality. But one of the areas that is being considered for up to a 30% cut is education. Now, the federal government spends education money on essentially five things. We help the most disadvantaged children in the country learn how to read and do mathematics through Title I. We help children confronted with a learning disability, with Down syndrome or autism, get special education services through the IDEA. There are scholarships and student loans for people of all descriptions to get a higher education at a college or a tech school. There are programs for someone who's lost his job at an oil refinery or her job at a bank be retrained for their next job. And there's a small but crucial amount of money that helps our teachers become better instigators of science education or math education and instill in the next generations the hunger to learn and the power to achieve. 
You need not listen to members of Congress about the consequences of these kinds of cuts. Listen to the job generators of our country. Listen to Andrew Leveris, the leader of the Dow Chemical Company who was part of the Business Roundtable report in December, said the following, and I quote, I think if you had to go to the easy ones, education is a sweet spot for the government, for Congress, and for all of us. If we don't get a well-educated workforce back in this country, if we don't invest in science, technology, engineering, and math, if we don't pull it all together, he goes on to say there will be trouble. And he further says, so what we've got to do is, quote, have a sustained investment, government and public companies together, private partnerships in education. This is not the Democratic leader of the House. This is not President Obama's administration. This is the leader of Dow Chemical Company saying that to grow jobs in America and win global economic competition, we need to invest in education. The majority is taking us in exactly the wrong direction. Proposing cuts of up to 30% in education programs will be on the floor next week. So sadly, they've moved from ignoring the jobs problem to worsening it. Uh, we want to work together with the Republican Party and with independents to find ways to empower small businesses and entrepreneurs to put our country back to work. We spent nine and a half hours in this debate talking about something else. Let's get on with this debate, get on to business, put the American people back to work. And I would yield back to my friend from California. The uh, gentleman yields back, the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I yield to the gentlelady from North Carolina, I feel compelled to respond for just a minute to the remarks of my good friend from New Jersey uh, that underscores the fundamental difference here. We believe that the issues that we have been talking about and are talking about today and will be talking about next week strike directly to the problem of unemployment and the lack of jobs in this country. Without fiscal responsibility, without addressing the exploding debt, without addressing the job-killing health care plan which we've done, and without addressing the blizzard of regulations that's coming out of this administration in every industry, we're not going to be able to, to create those jobs. It's a fundamental dis difference. The debate will go on. But clearly, we believe, and I believe, that we are directly addressing jobs because we found out over the last few years, certainly the last two years, that spending billions and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars does not, in fact, put America back to work. And so at this time, I'm pleased to yield four minutes to the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for four minutes. Uh, I thank you, Madam Chairman, and I thank the Chairman for yielding me time, and I rise today in support of HRS 72, which directs certain House committees to review the impact of federal regulations on job creation and economic growth. Last year, the Department of Education published a proposed regulation that sets a federal definition of gainful employment and requires certain institutions of higher ed to seek the Department's approval before creating new educational programs. This regulation will likely eliminate hundreds of course offerings and degree granting programs at proprietary and nonprofit institutions of higher education, preventing students from having access to these programs and often to careers that will ensure that the United States remains competitive. Access and affordability remain important pieces of the higher ed discussion. As voters resoundingly underscored in November, the federal government should be focused on accountability for taxpayer money, but that responsibility should not come at the expense of educational opportunities for students. Thomas Donahue, the president and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in a recent speech on the state of American business, listed the gainful employment regulation as a prime example of federal overreach. He pointed that out that if permitted to become final, the regulation would deny students access to colleges and universities across the country. Fewer students receiving the education and gaining the skills necessary to get a high-skilled, high-paying job means fewer people entering the workforce. While the proprietary school sector is a diverse group of institutions, many of these colleges and universities serve individuals who are looking for short-term education or seeking certifications that can be obtained in a year or less. These are exactly the types of educational programs that provide individuals with new skills that can immediately be put to use in today's dynamic workplace. One of the many benefits of the proprietary school sector is its ability to create quickly new programs to train students 
to help the local population meet the labor shortages of a particular area. Many of these institutions have advisory boards composed of key business leaders in the program areas offered by the institution. The proposed gainful employment regulation will take away that flexibility by requiring the federal government's approval for every new program created at a proprietary institution. While we can all agree that we do not want bad programs to exist, this regulation paints an entire sector of higher education with the same brush and does nothing to give incentives to, students, to institutions to improve their student outcomes. This regulation could also have a disproportionate impact on programs that serve low-income students who may need to borrow more funding under federal student loan programs to pay for their education. In either case, colleges and universities will have difficulty enrolling students into educational courses that prepare them for careers. The gainful employment regulation is the exact opposite of what the federal government needs to be pushing during an economic downturn. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlewoman from California. Well, once again, uh, instead of working to rebuild our country and create jobs, this House of Representatives is engaged in a debate on a measure that offers neither. For 10 hours and two days, the House of Representatives' time is tied up on a motion telling our committees to perform their constitutional duties. We understand that vigorous oversight and rooting out inefficiencies and waste are absolutely essential and there are our duties and we must perform them on behalf of the taxpayers. That's not a question. We know that. In fact, on January 15th, the Education and Workforce Committees unanimously approved an oversight plan. That plan calls for review of regulations. This resolution calls for review of regulations. Today's debate is du duplicative. It is duplicative of our oversight plans. It is unnecessary and a total waste of taxpayers' dollars. Worse yet, we're taking away valuable time when we could be rolling up our sleeves, getting the number one priority of the American people in front of us, creating jobs. For instance, the Education and Workforce Committee could be responding to the very real skills crisis that our nation's workers and businesses are facing. A recent article in the Washington Post found that in November there were an estimated 3.2 million job opportunities uh, across the country. However, businesses interviewed by the Washington Post with help wanted signs were struggling to find workers with sufficient skills. This is in the United States of America. This has crippled their ability to keep the line running and uh, keeping their doors open. This is a major disconnect, Madam Speaker, a disconnect that must be explored and it must be quickly addressed. Certain sectors, sectors such as health care and technology are projected to grow considerably over the next decade. These sectors actually require more skilled workers, not fewer. That's why our committee should be back in our committee room right now looking to ensure the connection between employers and uh, their want to hire workers uh, can be fulfilled. That means looking at training and education programs that connect to the jobs available today and in the future. At a time when jobs are important, this shortfall means lost economic opportunity for millions of Americans. It means a shortfall of businesses that want to make it in America with American workers. Now, when it comes to reviewing regulations, I've heard some disturbing views from the other side of the aisle recently. I refuse to accept the argument that our nation's health and safety protections need to be reduced to the level of China's in order to compete. There is a reason why the law of the land ensures basic health and safety protections on the job. And that reason is too often written in the blood of dead workers. Rolling back protections to satisfy powerful special interests at the expense of worker safety is a fool's errand. Relying on faulty one-sided studies that exaggerate the cost of worker safety regulations while excluding any of the benefits, such as the life of a family's breadwinner, leads to a dishonest debate. 
We've seen the deadly results of failing to properly regulate. We've seen what happens when you rely on self-certification, voluntary compliance, and inadequate protections. Eleven workers die when an oil rig blows up in the Gulf of Mexico. Workers die over and over again on massive construction projects on the Las Vegas Strip. Fourteen workers die in a sugar refinery outside of Savannah, Georgia, because there are no protections covering combustible dust. There are 700 workers losing their jobs in North Carolina because loopholes in OSHA regulations allow a massive factory explosion to happen. The explosion killed three and injured more than 50 workers. And that factory is now relocating rather than rebuilding, dealing with this community a double tragedy. Madam Speaker, without proper regulation and enforcement, workers are misclassified as independent contractors, robbing them of benefits, robbing our nation's treasury, and putting lawbreakers at an unfair advantage over law-abiding employers. And workers' hard-earned pensions are gambled away. We have the best workers in the world, and these workers deserve basic protections. Our nation's workers also deserve a Congress devoted to growing and strengthening the middle class, not meaningless debates like today's. I urge this Congress, get to the business of the American people without delay. The business of this Congress should be about jobs, and the business of this Congress should be about rebuilding our nation's competitiveness and that business should begin now. We cannot afford any further delays or distractions. With that, I uh, reserve the balance the of my time. The lady reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Now I'm pleased to yield uh, five minutes to the chair of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. The uh, gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Speaker, last November, uh, the people of Michigan, workers that long defined manufacturing, sent a message to Washington that business as usual in this town is not working. Currently, the unemployment rate in my home state is at 11.7 percent, and even higher in some counties in my 7th Congressional District. Over the past two years, we've witnessed burdensome laws being opposed on businesses and still feel the threat of costly regulation that prevents companies from growing and hiring. Small businesses are the engine of job creation in this country. Even the current administration believes that, and I quote, that they bear a disproportionate share of federal regulatory burden. The Office of Advocacy at Small Business Administration reports the total cost of federal regulation has increased to $1.75 trillion. The cost per employee for businesses with fewer than 20 workers now averages $10,585. A Heritage Foundation study found last year alone the federal government issued 43 major regulations with costs estimated in tens of billions of dollars. One of the threats many employers face is working with the current Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Everyone recognizes the need for common sense rules that promote workplace safety. However, onerous rules and regulations should not be a roadblock to job creation and economic growth. Currently, regulations by OSHA cost small businesses, which are defined as businesses with fewer than 500 employees, between $650 and $781 per employee. There are serious questions about whether OSHA's punishment before prevention approach to workplace safety is really the best interest of the workers. Last month, OSHA withdrew two costly proposed regulations. OSHA's noise standards proposal will have mandated companies spend thousands or millions of dollars for quieter machinery when simple, adequate solutions are already in place. A week later, 
OSHA temporarily repealed its musculoskeletal uh, skeletal disorders reporting requirement after claiming it did not receive enough insight from small businesses to proceed. This would have overwhelmed our small business owners in paperwork and potentially opened the door for increased fines. And while it was repealed, I cannot stress the unease many businesses feel about knowing the fact that this is only a temporary withdrawal. There have also been expressed concerns about the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division recently establishing a new arrangement with the American Bar Association. This agreement, known as the Bridge to Justice program, sets the stage for the potential of costly litigation of a great many companies by trial lawyers uh, who out, uh, are, are out to line their own pockets. This arrangement goes into effect when the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division receives a complaint that it will not investigate. It sends the, the claimant a referral to the American Bar Association, who will help provide private attorneys for them to pursue their claim. Will this new referral arrangement between the Wage and Hour Department and the American Bar Association truly help workers, or is it intended to punish the employers? This is a critical issue especially for small business. In our subcommittee, it's my goal to find answers to many questions facing our workforce and employers. Questions like, are the rules providing the necessary protection to workers or merely creating costly animosity between government and free enterprise? How can we more fully understand and protect the interests of workers and employers alike? In other words, are the regulations that govern our workforce sensible or arbitrary. Madam Speaker, Congress needs to step up its oversight of the Department to ensure their proposals do not hinder a business's ability to grow, hire new workers, or ensure the co cooperation of its employees to advance workplace safety. It is my objective as the Subcommittee Chairman of Workforce Protections to examine regulations as they relate to the workplace. The committee will look at any policy or proposal, regardless of whether it is a Democrat or Republican idea, that may lead to fewer jobs and opportunities for the, work, for the American workforce. We plan to hold hearings to determine how to best remove the burden of government regulation on our businesses while holding fast to our commitment to workplace safety. I yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California. Well, Madam Speaker, we need to talk more about what real regulations are that uh, we should be uh, focusing on, not the regulations for oversight that we've already determined we're going to handle committee by committee, particularly this committee, and we always have. But, you know, the uh, USA Today had an article uh, about the uh, sugar blast victims in Savannah, Georgia. and. Uh, one of, one of the uh, victims uh, is quoted in that article as saying, you know, because his brother was killed and he was injured, he says, I've been thinking about my brother uh, who was burned over almost half his body, and I know it could have been prevented. Well, now I'm going to say, with the right regulations, it could have been prevented. Uh, and this, then the article goes on to say, despite the outcry after the blast, the blast that I said had killed 14 people and injured 40 others, the United St States still lacks federal regulations requiring industrial plants to prevent the buildup of fine dust particles that can form explosive clouds in confined areas. The, uh, the regulations that we have, that OSHA has to work with, are so outdated that they, they don't include sugar refineries or other industries that would benefit from having dust uh, regulations. Uh, the article went on to say that federal regulators concluded that the explosion and fire at the refinery in Port Wentworth, just west of Savannah, was caused by a spark that ignited sugar dust like gunpowder. The blast set off secondary dust explosions that turned the pack packaging plant where Butler worked with his 35-year-old brother, John Calvin Butler, into fiery rubble. 
Last summer, OSHA and their administration proposed $8.7 million in fines against Imperial Sugar and cited the company for 211 safety violations at its two refineries here in coastal Georgia and in uh, Louisiana. OSHA has a dust regulation from, as I told you earlier, the 1980s covering grain and plant silos. But another federal agency says that's not enough because food processors, yes, wood manufacturers, yes, and other industries face the same risks. Why are they not covered? Where are the regulations? Why are we not bringing OSHA into the 21st century instead of having a debate today that has nothing to do with jobs and protecting our workers and instead on talking about oversight regulations that we are already uh, committed to deal with on our committee. Uh, Madam Speaker, in 2006, the uh, USA Today article goes on to say, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, uh, which investigates industrial accidents, called on OSHA to close that gap by adopting a new combustible dust regulation. Over the past three decades, the board says about 300 dust explosions have killed more than 120 workers nationwide. Those are the regulations we should be dealing with. Those are the debates we should be having. Those are the steps we should be taking to bring OSHA into the 21st century, not keeping it back in the dark ages. With that, I, I will reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves the uh, gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased at this time to yield one minute to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Austria. The uh, gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. I, I think we all agree that quality education is important, and I rise today to discuss a regulation that will unduly burden our schools and communities. Uh, last October, the Department of Education released the Program Integrity Regulations. Many educators feel and fear that these regulations will have a broad reach and require programs to be licensed in each state where students reside. Let me give you an example of a small university in a small county in Ohio, Pickaway County, this county has lost uh, 2,500 jobs and only has an 11% baccalaureate rate. OCA, or OCU I'm sorry, created an online degree program which currently has 1,000 students enrolled from 15 states. In addition to educating these students, OCU has created over 150 jobs in five years. If required to be licensed in all 15 states, OCU would be forced to unenroll at least half of the online students and lay off staff. If implemented improperly, this regulation would impact smaller colleges and universities like OCU who don't have the resources to comply with this heavy burden. It's expired. Thank more seconds. Uh, let me just conclude by just saying that the regulations are unclear with states as to what extent they're, they're going to uh, cover this, uh, this program. And it, I hope, my uh, hope is that the chairman will address this and the Education Workforce Committee will review this job-killing regulation. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The uh, gentlelady from California is recognized for 30 seconds. Could you tell us uh, the amount of time we have on both sides? Yes. The gentleman from, uh, the, the gentleman from Minnesota has 45 seconds. The gentlelady from California has 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll use these will be my closing remarks, Mr. Chairman. So we've had 10 and a half hours, two days of debate on regulations uh, for oversight regulations that our committee and other committees have already agreed they are going to deal with. This to me shows that the Republicans are truly in disarray. We are not discussing jobs, the most important issue in the United States of America for our people, and at the same time uh, in their disarray the Republicans are pushing an irresponsible and dangerous spending bill that will Delay threaten time jobs. Expired. With that, I yield back to the yeah, gentleman, my gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm very pleased that we're spending this time talking about real job creation. For the last two years, we've watched the Democrats spend literally trillions of dollars in failed efforts to create jobs with more government spending. We need to get the private sector back to work. 
We've heard examples here today, and we'll hear more this afternoon, of how this blizzard of regulations is getting in the way of that job creation and preventing Americans from getting back to work. We need to step up to our responsibility, and this is just the opening of that discussion as we step up to do our jobs and oversight. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The, uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to uh, claim the Agriculture Committee's time, which I believe I'm sharing with my colleague uh, from Minnesota. The gentleman is recognized. And I would yield myself uh, five minutes, uh, Madam the Speaker. Is recognized for five minutes. Today, American agriculture is under attack. Every day, the administration seems to demonstrate just how vastly disconnected it is from the folks who feed us. The administration fails to realize that rural America's economy is dependent on agriculture. The in-your-face approach that the administration has taken regarding government regulation has increased the cost of doing business for America's farmers and ranchers. If the administration is allowed to continue down this path, the only choice many farmers and ranchers will have will be to stop farming altogether. From the dairies of Vermont to the wheat fields near the Chesapeake Bay to the corn fields in the Midwest, American agriculture is under a constant barrage of irrational and unworkable regulations from the Environmental Protection Agency, which are burdensome, overreaching, and that negatively affect jobs and rural economies. This EPA is mostly interested in pursuing the extreme agenda of environmentalist groups without any consideration for the impact it will have on our farmers and ranchers. For example, the EPA wants to treat milk spills like oil spills, simply because milk contains animal fat. The EPA has suggested that milk storage should be regulated under the Clean Water Act as large oil tanks. The EPA wants farmers to till fields without producing any dust. Clearly the folks at the EPA have never stepped foot on a farm in western Oklahoma, or otherwise they would know that dust happens and all the regulations in the world can't eliminate its existence. The EPA wants farmers to ensure that none of the spray we use for pests drifts even one foot away from the original source. The EPA has started an unprecedented re-re-evaluation, yes I said re-re-evaluation of the popular weed control product Atrazine. In 2006, the EPA completed a 12-year review involving 6,000 studies and 80,000 public comments. Yet one of the first orders of business for the Obama administration was to start all over after an article appeared in the New York Times. The EPA is trying to regulate watersheds based off of inaccurate and flawed models, a problem recognized even by the top officials at USDA. The list goes on and on. But what further illustrates the alarming frame of mind of the EPA is that the agency has gone so far as to recently hold a contest for the public to create videos explaining why federal regulations are important to everyone. In many instances, the agency is overreaching its authority instead of operating within the law. The EPA believes it can order Congress to pass legislation that gives it more authority and threaten to regulate away if Congress chooses not to act. The message from the President is clear. Pass a cap and tax bill or we'll pursue an endangerment finding. Pass more authority to regulate watersheds or we'll proceed with an executive order. Sadly for America's farmers and ranchers, these regulations are not limited to the EPA. The Department of Agriculture's grain inspection packers and stockyard agencies propose rule for purported fairness far exceeds congressional intent expressed in the 2008 Farm Bill. It lacks a credible economic analysis and has so far been the result of a regulatory process that can only be described as flawed. We have a responsibility 
to producers, packers, processors, retailers, and yes, consumers, to continue to examine this proposal's implications and act accordingly. In addition, over the past several months, the CFTC and other federal financial regulators have been engaged in writing unprecedented new regulations over the derivatives market. As Chairman Gensler pointed out to our committee yesterday, since September alone, the CFTC has issued 39 new rules proposals involving thousands of pages of regulation. By comparison, before Dodd-Frank, the CFTC averaged about five rules per year. The speed with which the TF CFTC is issuing new rules precludes their ability to conduct an adequate cost-benefit analysis to ensure that the rules do not impose unnecessary or undue regulations on our financial system and our economy. And unlike many of the provisions of Dodd-Frank, Title VII is not limited to financial firms. In fact, it has the potential to impact every segment of our economy, from farmers and ranchers to manufacturers and energy companies to the fields of health care and technology. Yet many of the rules that CFTC has proposed would substantially increase the cost of hedging. Time has expired. I yield myself, uh, Madam Speaker, an additional 30 seconds. Gentlemen, it's yielded an additional 30 seconds. Many of the rules of the TFC, CFTC has proposed would substantially increase the cost of hedging for commercial end users, excluding Wall Street in, in extending Wall Street regulation to Main Street companies. As we work to revive the economy and create new jobs, we simply cannot afford sweeping new regulations that are poorly vetted, that impose substantial cost and outweigh the benefits for our financial system and our economy, or that are crafted in the interest of speed rather than sound policy. The Agriculture Committee has set forth an aggressive oversight plan that will shine a bright light on these regulations and show the real-world consequences of them. I hope the administration will work with us in our efforts. Our nation's farmers, ranchers, small businesses are all counting on us to do it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I reserve the balance of my time. The, uh, the gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I, joy, I rise today to join in the, this discussion with my good friend and uh, Chairman Lucas uh, of the Agriculture Committee. And uh, as the Chairman indicated yesterday on a bipartisan basis, we adopted the oversight plan, uh, uh, such as what we have done uh, in the past uh, when we were in in charge of the committee, uh, working on a bipartisan basis, and I would argue that uh, the committee, uh, under our, my jurisdiction, did uh, the oversight work that was necessary, and we made the changes and uh, addressed the issues uh, as they came up. Uh, we made significant improvements in the Farm Bill back uh, in, in 08 in terms of conservation programs, uh, other kinds of things, crop insurance, uh, through the new SRA that was adopted in May. So I would argue that uh, we did our work on the Agriculture Committee. A good part of the chairman's time was taken talking about the EPA, <clears throat> and uh, I can, couldn't have concur with him more, but the problem is we don't have jurisdiction over the EPA, and uh, I hope that uh, under the new leadership here that we will be able to work with the committees that have jurisdiction so we can straighten out some of the things that are going on uh, over in the EPA and some of these other agencies um, but uh, all we can control is what we have under our jurisdiction in the Agriculture Committee, and I can commit to you that the Democrats on the committee will work with the Republicans to make sure that we do the right things uh, on the Agriculture Committee, that we follow the plan that we adopted yesterday, that we uh, do the aggressive oversight. We are 100 percent in, in favor of that. And, uh, you know, in terms of the issues that the chairman talked about, that uh, are under our jurisdiction, uh, the GIPSA law or rule that's uh, being proposed, the CFTC rule that's being proposed. Uh, these are still proposed rules and they're going through the process. And I have some optimism that uh, at the end of the day that those things are going to come to a point where they're, um, uh, they're reasonable and acceptable, but uh, if they are, we will take a look at it. In terms of the CFTC, that uh, they are in the process of implementing. And the reason they're doing it is because we asked them to do it. This is not something they've manufactured over there. This has been uh, 
directed by the Congress. And I would argue that uh, it's needed. You know, uh, uh, we had a situation, they were only doing five regulations a year before because we had a $600, $700 trillion market that was completely unregulated, completely in the dark, uh, and it caused, uh, it was a big part of this financial crisis and collapse that we had. And, uh, you know, at the time that we did the CFMA back in uh, 2000, uh, we were told that the folks that were in this swap market uh, were rich people. They had, 10 million, they had to have $10 million to even get into this market. They were gambling with their own money, you know, and uh, it really it, it was none of our business that they were rich. They knew what they were doing, uh, you know, that uh, if they wanted to gamble their money, that was their business. Problem is, uh, we find out uh, that they weren't putting the money up, they weren't putting the capital and collateral behind these swaps, and it almost took down the entire world financial system. So uh, I would argue that a lot of what the CFTC is working on are things that are going to have to be done, not that I'm a big fan of regulation, but, uh, you know, in this case, uh, uh, the private sector went amok, and you know, in some of these areas, and I think we're going to have to require that they put their money up, they put up the capital and collateral, that uh, make sure that we don't get in a situation again where the uh, public has to bail out these financial firms. And we heard yesterday from the Secretary, uh, he has no intention of, of uh, regulating the end users. Uh, we gave that exemption in the law, and it looks like the way he's implemented, uh, the M uh, end users are not going to be subject to these capital and margin requirements. But on the other hand, the financial firms that qualify as swap dealers or swap participants are going to have to put their money up, and, and it needs to happen because we don't want to get in this situation again. So having said all of that, <clears throat> let's see what happens when they, with the final rules that they come out uh, with at the CFTC. Let's see what happens with the final rules that come out with GYPSA. You know, uh, I'm hopeful that we, we're going to get the right kind of outcome when they listen to everybody. They've had an open process. They've been listening, taking thousands of comments. Uh, but if there are problems and if they have gone beyond the law or if they've gone off in a direction that we didn't intend, I will work with the chairman to make sure that we get that straightened out. So uh, I am here today to pledge a cooperation of the minority on uh, these issues. I hope the chairman can convince his colleagues on these other committees that are driving us nuts in some of these areas and some of these other agencies that they will uh, come up with some process where we can be involved to straighten some of that out. I would love to work with you on that. And um, with that, we're, um, we're with you 100%. We have no other speakers. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time, and we look forward to working with uh, the chairman and the other members to get the right kind of outcome. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Oklahoma.